My name is Rebecca Watson. I am with Collaborative Labs at St. Petersburg College, and I'm really excited to be here with you tonight as a neutral facilitator for Tampa Bay Next. I know it's sad, but I got to record because um, we're also doing a live webinar. Uh, so I'll do my best to try and minimize the echo with the distance from the mic to the mouth. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. It's a really important community working group discussion about transportation. As you know, there is a lot going on in transportation in the downtown and urban core areas. A lot of studies, a lot of projects, a lot of agencies coming together to work on transportation solutions. And tonight we want you to have an overview of sort of what's going on. So we have a series of presentations lined up for you to talk about different initiatives and projects that are being worked on, uh, specifically around the downtown and urban core areas. And because our agenda is really jam-packed and there's a lot of good information in here tonight, I want to ask if you can hold your questions to the end. There are comment cards on the table, so if you want to jot down your questions as the presentations are moving from one to the next, feel free to do that. And also, if you'd like to leave a comment on um, heightsmobility.com, some of you may have already interacted with that site. We do have a tablet live connected to the site just to my right there. So if at any point this evening an idea, a comment, a question comes to you and you'd like to enter it on heightsmobility.com, we invite you to do that at your leisure. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get um, the presentation started. Just check in here. So the first set of presentations is about transit initiatives. And I want to invite Karen Kress up to get us started. She's going to give us an update on the Tampa Downtown Partnership. Karen? Good afternoon, everyone. I couldn't read this one yet. OK, so I work with the Tampa Downtown Partnership. We're a nonprofit organization that has a contract with the city of Tampa to help manage downtown. My sole focus is on transportation and urban planning related issues. We have been working really hard to offer mobility choices within the downtown, within the downtown area. We don't have the wherewithal to control what happens to a regional mass transit robust system, but at least when people get to downtown, we've been building the different ways they can move around. So I just wanted to quickly run through that list with you and then we can turn it over to the future speakers. First thing on my list is always walking. In downtown Tampa, we have sidewalk on both sides of the road. We have a crosswalk. We have drivers who are expected to see pedestrians, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and often walking, uh, kind of is a secret that I hope you will spread, is that it's the quickest way to get around. So um, that's always first on my list. Uh, second on my list is the streetcar. I know you'll hear more about that. Uh, it runs between downtown and Ybor City right now. It is free every Saturday, quick plug for them through the fiscal year. And um, you'll hear more about the, the uh, potential to expand that program. The plant first phase of the planning, I described it as what the streetcar wouldn't be when it grows up. So I think that we have determined that now. Now they're ready for it to kind of take off and be accepted. Um, Heart, you'll also hear from, but we're super excited uh, that in downtown Tampa, we have one of the first in the country autonomous transit vehicles running up a north-south corridor that's dedicated to bus only during the day. Uh, so that would be a great north-south mobility distributor as people who come, especially off the Marion Transit Center, need to get back into the city and come down. Uh, you'll also hear from Host Bike Share, but we are uh, proud to partner with them and in many different ways. We've had uh, 300 bikes available in the greater downtown area, and we hope that number will continue to grow. You'll hear from Eric on that. Uh, none of us were exactly sure whether it would be successful when it first started, but Eric will assure you the numbers are there and you see those free bikes pretty often. So the next challenge is to get people to use those bikes more for a mode of transportation to replace a car trip than just for purely recreational rides. So that's, that's what our next focus will be. Uh, the downtowner, you may have heard about the free electric shuttle, um, free, the free ride service we have in our downtown area. It's, it's like Uber or Lyft, but it's restricted to the downtown and currently it's free and that's a door-to-door -door service. Uh, we launched that uh, about 13 months ago. We served about 180,000 passengers. 
staff members in our first year. It, um, it, it would truly be in love to death. Um, it, we get requests all day long from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. and up to 7 p.m. for service. We are trying to figure out what to do with that because we can't keep up with the demand. With Tampa Downtown Partnership, with really looking at business and transportation, we were just kind of in a unique, a unique position to get that started. And we have uh, partners from both the private sector and from the downtown hotels and commercial office towers that all helped to fund it, as well as the Florida Department of Transportation and the City of Tampa. So uh, one of the unique things that we're able to do is really think of it as a micro transit system. And we asked just about a month ago, started, started intuitively matching riders with similar origin and destination. So um, basically it's carpooling, they call it comboing, I guess it sounds more cool, but we're hoping that we can serve more, pa more than our 500 passengers a day on average and, and get, those, get those kind of carpooling type scenarios going. So hopefully you'll take advantage of that. You just download an app and it's pretty easy to do from there. Uh, I'm also working as a related on a comprehensive downtown parking plan for downtown. We work closely with the city of Tampa on that as well as some private parking operators. Uh, over 70% of the parking available in downtown is actually privately controlled, although we all think it's really the city and the county's job to do most of the operating on parking. So we'll be looking at all aspects of parking as it relates to development, what the codes require, um, event parking issues, on-street parking, for instance, it's still free on nights and weekends in downtown on street north of Kennedy Boulevard. Do we still need to offer free parking in downtown Tampa? You know, those, those are some of the recommendations that we come back on that. Um, also, the, the parking pricing, is there a good variety of pricing options out there for people? Uh, I hope that some of the recommendations come back to, sh to show that we need even more mobility options than we currently have so we can continue to help fund those and build those up. Hopefully get some more parking for folks. The other thing I'm working on related to transportation is wayfinding. We have some wayfinding signs that were installed almost 10 years ago. There's over 200 of them. And those are the vehicular sign that, you know, Strav's kind of this way, Florida Aquarium that way. There's parking related signs. There are pedestrian level signs that um, we, we want to start adding in how many minutes it would take you to walk there to again get back to that walking to show people how quick and easy and physical it is to get around. But those signs were installed almost 10 years ago and a lot has happened in downtown. We have uh, roads that are now two-way that used to be one-way. We have new destinations. We have a children's museum we didn't even on design, for instance. New segments of the river walk have opened up. So we're in the enviable position that those signs are really outdated. So we're, we literally have this Fulton going through every single sign on every single block and seeing what needs to be um, updated and added to, et cetera. Uh, two other quick things. Um, we are going to be working with the city closely on a way to count bicycles and tricyclists and pedestrians. Other than, other than using volunteers with flipboards, we keep doing tick marks as people walk by. There's some technology that pretty easily enables you to do that. So thanks to the Florida Department of Transportation, uh, I was able to get some grant money and we'll work closely with the city to get some key position bike head count information. And then the last thing is um, the uh, VIA, the Tampa Liquor Expressway Authority. You probably have heard that they've gotten a lot of press for their connected vehicle project. So that would be focused on the reversible lanes on the Kelman Expressway, the toll road, um, to help, uh, you can actually, I think there's still ways for you to sign up. You can get a kind of a high-tech rear view mirror installed into your car to use that toll road on a regular basis. And you can tell the difference in the speed of lanes and collisions and things. And then the other part of it is they're going to be focusing on the corridors in downtown from a pedestrian aspect. So there will be an app that pedestrians can download to help them with their safety and get connected to some infrastructure that's actually moving around. So um, lots of cool stuff going on downtown. Always open to your feedback, your ideas. There's lots of things to do out there, and I'm um, looking for good public-private partnerships in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Uh, we're going to keep it moving with Milton Martinez, who will tell us more about the streetcar extension study. Milton? Good evening. Uh, my name is Milton Martinez. I'm the project manager for the city of Tampa on the Tampa's Envision Tampa. All right. 
show. Are you ready? Not I wish I had a curtain. It's not working. I've been staring at it. Uh, I need to get it down here. Try this again. Okay. Testing. Hello? Can you hear me? Uh, good evening. My name is Milton Martinez. I am the project manager for the city of Tampa on the city's Envision Tampa Streetcar Project. Uh, with me, I also have Steve Shoecraft, who is a deputy project. Okay. Uh, hello? Okay. So again, my name is Milton Martinez. Apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, with the city of Tampa, the project manager on the Envision Tampa Streetcar project. Uh, with me also is Steve Shoecraft, who is with HDR, and he's our pro uh, deputy project manager on the project. Still can't hear me? Okay. So as everyone knows, we've been we're, we've kind of been in the middle of our project. We're in, uh, wrapping up phase one of the project and ge gearing up to go into phase two. So we're doing a lot of the final uh, putting together the documentation package and and the, uh, developing our implementation and, stra and strategy funding strategy plan for the project. Um, we just completed and under phase one several of our public involvement meetings and uh, engaging with the public on getting input on determining the, the different alignments and, and uh, trying to determine which uh, would be the preferred alignment uh, for the extension. The intent of the project is, uh, is, uh, is to expand the service, to also um, extend the service area so that we can uh, bring more of the commuter um, users into the, and to be able to use the system as well. And also to extend the service times as well, the system, and to modernize the system as well. So um, at this point, I'll turn it over to Steve Shoecraft to give you more, a little bit more detail on where we are with the project and the next steps on that as well. Kind of loud, loudly. So the, the streetcar extension study is to look at both the modernization of the existing line and the extension of the line. So we started that process about nine months ago. Uh, we started with, at a very basic level to try to understand what the dynamics were, influencing existing conditions downtown and potential future conditions. We did a careful evaluation of um, existing transportation and mobility systems. We looked at land use and economic development. Uh, we studied uh, the sort of dynamics, not just in the core of downtown, but what was identified in the envision, uh, the envision planning work that the city did several years ago as the broad definition of downtown, which included west of the river, over to Ybor City, north of Tampa Heights. So in that process, we developed uh, a purpose and means statement to define objectives for the project. So what are we trying to accomplish? What's the point of some form of a project or investment? We looked at broad corridors where we were seeing patterns of uh, either existing population employment that would support a transit investment or um, potential projections for population employment that would support a transit trip to generate a market for an investment of that scale. We 
We did a series of public workshops, as Milton mentioned, and we asked questions about those broad corridors. We refined those and identified seven alternatives for an extension, um, and we compared those alternatives across a whole range of metrics. So we looked at population and employment, ridership, cost, uh, sort of physical barriers and constructability issues, and we looked at um, potential impacts to communities, um, uh, benefits to low-income communities or transit, transit dependent communities. Uh, we stacked those up against one another and we made a recommendation in our last public workshop that it looked like the most promising alternative was to go north through the core of downtown, either along Franklin or Tampa, Florida, or some combination of those streets. North to 275, which gets us to the location of a potential uh, intermodal center. And then north, uh, several blocks from the Tampa Heights, we showed the lines on the map going to Palm Avenue. So that would take the existing system and improve it or modernize it so you could run more frequent service over longer periods of the day, and then extend that system north from the Whiting Street Station through the core of downtown where all that employment, you know, all that employment concentration is, north to the intermodal center to make the first mile, last mile connection to a regional system and then north into Tampa Heights. Uh, the other thing that we've looked at is we're trying to build that idea about an initial extension uh, as something that could be extended further to go potentially to West Shore and potentially to the airport, depending on how the sort of Western configuration works. So the idea is this is a, a promising project now at a scale we think we can attract or organize funding to support with the potential to expend further uh, to support other markets and to provide a more robust uh, sub-regional or, or portion of a regional system. So where we are now in the process is we've got that organized as the preferred alignment. We're starting to look at the different vehicle technologies. So right now we have the heritage streetcars, which are somewhat smaller scale than a modern streetcar. Um, we're comparing those to a modern streetcar, but we're also looking at a rubber tire option. And the rubber tire option has the potential to convert over the long term into some sort of a automated transit vehicle sort of technology. So we're starting to compare those against one another to see what the cost and performance implications are. And then that'll queue us up for the next phase of the study where we take a preferred alignment alternative, a preferred modernization strategy, and a preferred technology into more detailed uh, planning and impact assessment. So we're looking to kick off that second phase of the project in uh, the January, February time. Right now, we're looking at a U with the potential for that connection to happen in the future. Now, there's a possibility that if the stadium lands in some magical location, that would result in demand to look at the study in a slightly different way. So there's some things that could cause us to shift course as we move into phase two, but right now, we have that basic U, which really focuses on making that core of downtown connection, the intermodal center connection, and then touch the south end of the Thank you. Thanks so much. Good afternoon or evening. Uh, first, I have to say I'm a little disappointed. I've always wanted to be a stadium announcer, and that was as close as I was going to get to that. Uh, I get bad jokes. We're going to have a couple more of those. Uh, so my name is Eric Troll. I'm the program director for Coast Bike Share. I also run Juice Bike Share up in Orlando. Uh, so all over the state. This is our first date uh, here in the Long Bank. Uh, set that time to put 500,000 miles on the bikes, which is insane, uh, especially as Karen mentioned uh, a little bit ago. We never even knew if this was going to work. Um, no less uh, 500,000 miles and about 50,000 users. Uh, so today we've got uh, operations in downtown. Uh, with uh, 300 bikes, downtown St. Pete with 300 bikes, and up in Orlando with 100 bikes. But how does that take care of you guys? That's it. Thank you. So what are we going to do about that? We're going to get you guys some bikes. Expand. We're going to expand. Thank you, Stephen. Checks in the mail. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what we have going on for the next uh, probably two quarters, uh, we're going to try and move a little quicker than that, get stuff out before, before March, uh, is 200 bikes. Uh, so what I want to do with those 200 bikes is bring them to Soho because there's density down there. But that, again, doesn't take care of you guys. But I want to bring them up here. 
Uh, so our goal for expansion into the Heights is uh, essentially using the, the, the highway as our, our uh, border to the, uh, the east for the time being, uh, Hillsboro to the north for the time being. I realize that doesn't take care of everybody in the room, but we got to start somewhere. Uh, and then the river on the west side. Uh, so with that, there's a lot of uh, a lot of right away restrictions. There's not a lot of city owned land and, and really large sidewalks like you're fortunate enough to have in downtown. Um, so in this early stages of planning, we're going to move really quickly on this. We're looking to partner with any uh, any businesses uh, that want to uh, be connected to the system. That's an easy way for us to get get going uh, very very quickly, uh, potentially just after the beginning of the, the new year. Um, we're also on the residential side looking to, uh, to target all of our parks. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have quite a few parks scattered throughout uh, both uh, Tampa and Seminole Heights, uh, and that gives us great access to residential areas uh, up uh, pretty close to the river without um, conflicting with too much residential. Um, so uh, with those... Closing in five minutes. If you need help completing your task, we will be happy to assist you. If you're still waiting for someone to move up, please let us know. We've got to move. We've got five minutes. <laughs> um, so, so with that, um, those are those are uh, our plans over the next little bit. Uh, so, as Steve mentioned, the uh, the streetcar could be coming up to a, as far north as Palm. Uh, us going all the way up to Hillsboro gives us great connection uh, via two different corridors. We we uh, target Ola and Central as great bike routes um, to get down, uh, and then using the the grid system that we have up here. Uh, to get to our, our more business-centric locations on, on Florida, um, be it causing a little trouble at some of the bars, or just going out to uh, to get some dinner, uh, or, or just visiting some of the businesses. So those are our plans for the next uh, six months. Uh, like I said, if we if we find some good business partners that want to move quickly, uh, we could be up and running uh, with some connections within the next couple of months. Kimberly. Our businesses are off about 30 to 50% in revenues due to the most recent events in our community. So mm -hmm. we're going to need some help from agencies to make that happen. Cool. We're on board. Um, we, we like to consider ourselves a great marketing tool, um, not only locally, um, but because we operate as a regional system, uh, we're very much trying to serve that line that is the, uh, the Tampa Bay. Um, people are still hesitant to come over, although that cross trip is starting to happen a lot more. So us being the first regional transportation system, um, despite being on two wheels and more of a fun thing, we are transportation. Um, we're trying to get people to cross the bay that much more and using our, our marketing for that less. And I'm sure we got to move on. Yeah. Gary, um, what you mentioned uh, Central mm -hmm. and Ola. <laughs> yep. So would they uh, progress to put down at least Cheryl's and signage and such if that was to happen, if that was to become a... Uh, I can't speak for the city on that because we are a private entity. Um, I do know that those are the two more comfortable routes that connect north south throughout the entire district. Uh, but it is something we can, we can push for. I, I think that would help put pressure on it. Definitely. <laughs> and we've got that new mural, or part of it at least. That's back up, sorry. Uh, but we've got that new mural. So, like, the starts are there um, for that to happen, I think. So, we'll, we'll continue to push that as the expansion happens. But uh, I will be around. I've got cards if anybody wants to talk afterwards. Thanks so much. Thanks, Eric. Thanks. 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 My name is Marco Sandusky. I'm the Director of Government and Community Relations for Heart Your Transit Agency here in Hillsborough County. Um, for these slides. Uh, so, you know, really, really quickly, you know, oftentimes people look at a transit agency and they think about the technology, the vehicles that we operate, but we're really in the in the people business, right? Um, and so our business is really to help get people to where they need to go. Um, and so that's a real focus for us, is trying to kind of move beyond that, that bus company, uh, the old heart line, uh, to really being on the forefront of helping to solve transportation challenges and issues for people. Um, and so you see that reflected in our mission and our vision. Um, so, of course, you know us to be um, a bus agency. We operate the Tico Line streetcar. Uh, we also have van services, um, and we, we operate our own uh, transit-operated uh, rideshare program called uh, Hyperlink, which I'll talk about briefly. Um, but 
what we want to be able to, to show you here tonight is that ARC is really focused on being able to um, offer a family of solutions that can solve your mobility challenges. Looks like I'm stuck. All right, so I'm going to start by, by uh, just talking briefly about our, our bus service. You see different types of buses out in the community. Um, we operate local express and limited express um, buses. Uh, we also operate um, here on Nebraska, we operate the Metro Rapid service, which was uh, the first uh, bus rapid transit style um, uh, service to come uh, to, to our region. Um, and then we operate the in-towner in downtown Tampa that helps to provide some circulation at peak times um, on weekdays and, and has some weekend service to help with events. Um, so when it comes to our bus service, many of you may be familiar with a major redesign of the bus system. So if you could just raise your hand if you're familiar with the service changes that happen um, on the bus system on October 8th. Okay, great. So, so it looks like maybe about half the room um, has has a, a sense of these changes. The, the service changes that we implemented on October 8th were probably some of the most significant changes that we've ever made as, as an organization, as a transit system. And a lot of our customers have been asking us why. Why did you do this to the transit system? Um, and this effort, uh, which we call Mission Max, Modernizing and Aligning for Excellence, is really intended to help create and build a foundation for a sustainable transit system that we can build on into the future. And to try to operate service as efficiently as we can to make sure that we're providing value with the, 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 the limited tax dollars that, that we receive, um, but also that we uh, have a focus on getting people where they need to go. Um, and so uh, with Mission Max, we, we started back um, in the fall of 2016 and worked with uh, Tyndale Oliver to come up with uh, a, a major redesign of the system. We hadn't done this uh, since 2003, and obviously our community has changed a lot in that time period. Um, and so it was time for us to take a, a real hard look at how the system worked. We wanted to focus on improving travel times for riders, improving the directness of travel. So a lot of our routes went into and out of neighborhoods. Um, some of them took customers out of direction in order to get to their final destinations. Some of our routes we're doing were more focused on serving our transit centers than on serving major destinations, the places where people really need to go. So we try to focus on directness of travel. Um, we focused on, on this idea of frequency versus coverage. The system that we were operating before October 8th was a system that tried to be all things to all people. We tried to cover um, a service area that's the size of the state of Rhode Island by operating a lot of service that, uh, that came every hour or every 45 minutes, um, but we were covered. Um, where we moved after asking our customers where they wanted to see us focus, um, and, and, and hearing from them that they would be willing to walk a little bit further if that bus came more frequently. Uh, we use that principle to help design this, um, this, this updated system, uh, which has more frequent service on some of our core routes, um, but in some instances may require a little bit further walk to get to your closest bus. Um, and then lastly, an important principle for us was um, looking at regional connections. Um, and, and Scott is going to talk in a little bit about the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan, but it's really important for us as a local transit system to think, too, about how we fit into a regional network um, and to lay the foundation with our local system so that we can support uh, improved uh, regional connectivity on transit. Um, so, you know, at, at the end of the day, there were principles that were really important around improving the way the network operated. Uh, it had been 13 years since we had done a, a hard look at this. Uh, but there are also some fiscal realities for ART. Um, and so going into our fiscal year 18 uh, budget year, 
uh, we were not going to be able to operate the, the system that we operated in fiscal year 17. We couldn't afford it. Um, escalating costs of doing business um, have caught up with us. Um, and so it was, it, it not only was it necessary for us to do the, the comprehensive operations analysis, it was a necessity in order to make sure that we could go into fiscal year 18 and operate service that would really serve Hillsborough County effectively. Um, and so we went out to the public um, throughout this process to get their input. Um, early on, when it was when we were first getting uh, uh, trying to get input about about some of the trade-offs like frequency versus coverage, but then also as we started to bring out proposals and look at specific changes, we heard from over 28,000 people through this process, uh, which is really massive outreach, um, and it helped to shape the plan. Uh, we made a number of improvements and tweaks to the plan along the way based on some common sense that we heard from customers who looked at some of the things that we proposed along the way. So your input has been really important in the process um, because at the end of the day, heart is not, uh, the heart uh, bus system doesn't exist for heart, it's the community's system. And so it's very important for us to know that what we're putting out there is what people want to use. Um, so what you can see here is, is the, the previous system uh, with the revised system. Um, you can see that a lot of these routes have straightened out. It looks a little bit more like a grid. Um, in, in, in some areas you can see the consolidation of, of services. Um, but ultimately, this redesigned network improves service for 80% of our customers. Uh, which is a significant uh, feat on a network that is costing us less money to operate per year. Important for everybody to remember that this is not the ceiling for transit. Uh, this is really the floor for us. This is a foundation on which we uh, will be uh, building. Uh, and in February, we're going to be already adding some additional improvements to this network that we reset in October. Um, thanks to some funding uh, from the County Commission, uh, we're able to add and make some investments in increased frequency on more of our core routes. So today you already have improved service and more frequent service on Route 1 and Metro Rapid. Um, you have improved service on the Route 34. Um, those, uh, the, the Route 34, for example, is going to go to 15-minute frequency uh, in February along with frequency improvements on uh, numerous other routes. Um, so this is about building that foundation um, and then adding on new service, additional frequency in order to get more and more people riding this revised system. So very quickly, you think of us as a bus company, but we also remember operate van service. We operate our heart bus service for people with disabilities. Um, but we also have a heart flex uh, service that you may see vans out in some of our less dense areas where we provide service um, that, that, uh, that can really help with making some of the shorter trips and to connect people um, into our network. Um, and I invite you to look at our website. Uh, feel free to contact us for more information about how these van-based services work because they can really be an important lifeline and help people to access uh, really important places. Um, and then finally, uh, the hyperlink is something new for us. It's um, a great public-private partnership um, that uh, has been funded and supported uh, from FDOT. Uh, it's, uh, right now we're operating it in the University, Temple Terrace, and Brandon areas. And the whole concept here is to provide the convenience of, of, of a, an Uber or Lyft or ride share. So you have an app, um, you have a vehicle that will come pick you up uh, quickly and take you where you need to go within a zone, but it also gives you the reliability and accessibility that you should expect from transit so you can pay cash, you can make a reservation uh, via phone, you don't have to have an app, you don't have to use a credit card to utilize the service. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at, at Hyperlink and, and get inf more information there. Um, you heard uh, about the streetcar. Uh, we operate the, the Tico Line streetcar, and I encourage you, if you haven't done it yet, 
um, come out and use the streetcar on Saturdays because there's really no excuse. It's free on Saturdays. So I really encourage you to come out and use the, the streetcar. Um, and then finally, Karen mentioned the autonomous uh, transit project. We are really proud to uh, be leading the way here in the state of Florida with FDOT um, in uh, launching an autonomous transit uh, pilot program in downtown that's going to operate on the Marion Transit Way. Uh, this is a great way for us to test this technology, uh, to gauge the public's uh, interest and receptivity to the, the technology, uh, because there could be really great ways to apply it um, in, in our systems in the future. Um, so with that, um, we're on the move. We're partnering with a lot of different entities to try to bring solutions forward to help move people to the places that they need to go. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Scott because really his presentation really dovetails right into what we're doing because Scott is working uh, with us and with PSTA and PCPT um, on developing a regional transit plan that helps knit the local service with a regional vision and an ability to move people on some of those longer trips. Uh, before, before Scott, before you get started, everybody, Marco is the one who actually helped us have the trolley this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Marco. Good evening, everybody. My name is Scott Brindle. I'm the project manager from the consultant side for the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan. So, and I just love the conversation tonight, where we're really talking about moving people in different ways, looking at moving people in the city of Tampa, the county as a whole, and now I'm going to talk about that regional piece. My job is to look at how do we connect Tampa Bay as a region using what we call premium regional transit. Now I define it as premium because what we're talking about is something that gets you between A and B quickly, and you're gonna do that in the most cases by having it its own lane, its own space, so that we can get by past the congestion that we all experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Wait a second. So the purpose of the plan is three parts. First, before I get into the purpose, though, there we go. There's, if you think about building premium transit in Tampa Bay, you really have to answer three questions. The first question, of course, the obvious, what is it? What are we actually trying to build? But the second and the third are, how do you actually pay for that project, what you want to build, and who owns it and operates it? So my job is primarily to focus on Answering question number one, what is that project? What is the project that's going to be successful in Tampa Bay? How are we going to move people around cost, cost efficiently and have a project that truly performs? Because one of the things that are, is a, a particular focus of our plan is finding a way to successfully compete for federal grant dollars. There is a federal program out there for capital improvements from the federal aid, from the federal government, that we as a region have yet to succeed in that program. We've never gotten an FTA grant application for transit in Tampa Bay. So our number one goal is, can we find that project that's really going to compete and perform for those federal and state dollars? We're also going to look at technology, uh, just like Marco mentioned and uh, some of the other presenters, You know, looking at some of those driverless vehicles is a big part of what, the way we look at the transportation industry as a whole, and especially transit, when we look out five, 10 years into the future. And of course, at the end of the day, the most important thing we're gonna do is make sure that number one, we are serving Tampa Bay both today and tomorrow. So our schedule is pretty straightforward. We had two primary phases. The first phase, which started several months ago, was designed to come up with that draft recommendation. So what is the vision for Tampa Bay Regional Transit and where can we start? And we're gonna actually come forward with that recommendation here next month on January 19th. So if everybody has the opportunity, please join us uh, January 19th at the Tampa Bay Transportation Management Advisory Committee. It'll be the first time where we actually talk about that draft recommendation. However, there'll be plenty of chance for you to come out, reach out to me, reach out to the team, because from that point of January, we're literally gonna spend from January all the way to the end of September 
sort of vetting that plan with the community. So lots of chances to get engaged. You can also see uh, all the different engagement activities we've already done today uh, upcoming to this year. So in that first step, we're building that draft plan. Again, I guess I like the I like the threes, right? So there's three steps to that first year where we're answering the question, where is that top performing corridor? We have a good sense of what that is. We've identified that. Number two is, okay, well now you know where it is. What is it? Is it a rubber tire? Something like a bus or a bus rapid transit, express bus, light rail, commuter rail, what is that project? And the third is what we're working on right now is, okay, we know where the vision is, we know where the top performing corridors are, where do we start? Because that's something that I personally feel very strongly about that we in Tampa Bay have not done a very good job of in the past several decades. We can come to a vision, but we seem to stumble in identifying where we start. So I hope that's a key ingredient in making sure that we're successful. So that vision that I mentioned is here. You can see we have a lot of coverage connecting all parts of the region, but there's Pinellas, North Pinellas, into Pasco County. And what that actually provides us is within a half a mile walking distance from all those blue lines on that map, we're serving over six out of 10 jobs by 2040. So more than half of the jobs within the Tampa Bay region and half of the overall population or households by 2040. So great coverage, great opportunities here. And I'll be honest, you can look at this map here, and you can look at some of the studies that have come before me, a lot of similarity. It's the same need that we've been talking about for well over a decade. So we had a really good starting point in moving forward. So I mentioned that once we knew where the top performing corridors are, the next step was what is on them. We looked at a variety of transit modes. We looked at everything from water ferries, to light rail, commuter rail, as well as, as well as rubber tire. And that's one of those items too, and I just flashed a couple of uh, pictures up here, that driverless autonomous vehicle, you know, it's really fast. I mean, two years ago, three years ago, I could not talk about some of the specifications of this technology because we just, we didn't have the information yet. Yet within that time frame, we've seen great advances in the technology, and there's a lot of opportunity what we can do with that technology moving forward. So once we knew the where and the what, then we ran into another evaluation process, which again, we're looking at how can we be competitive for those state and federal grant dollars? What is the return on investment? What are the impacts? Uh, what are the benefits? And you know, we had several workshops and what, what are people saying about those, those corridors? So at the end of that process, and pretty much where we stand right now, is we're really focusing in and uh, in and around the I-275 corridor, all the way from Wesley Chapel, through Tampa, West Shore, into downtown St. Pete. We're also looking at connecting USF and Tampa along in and around the CSX school. So what, within those two corridors, we're actually looking at a multiple series of uh, different technologies. You can see those there. That's, that's, that's my workload for this uh, last couple of months. Um, and we look at all different segments of the 275 corridor. We're looking at rubber tire solutions. Is it rubber tire in its own lane? Is it rubber tire with other vehicles or an express lane? Is it light rail? Is it commuter rail? And, and that's really the detail that we're going to come forward with here in January when we're going to start comparing things like the 275 corridor to Florida and Nebraska, which is in this neighborhood from Tampa to USF, one of the most uh, highest performing ridership portions of that entire corridor. We're going, to, we're going to compare ridership. We're going to compare how much does it cost to operate. We're going to compare how much does it cost to construct. And again, at the end of the day, how are we going to get the dollars to get that project started? So some of the things you can expect is those type of comparisons between the corridors, as well as we're going to have information about some station locations. Some good examples here, Florida, Nebraska, MLK, Hillsborough, Waters, and Fowler are great opportunities to connect to the community and really starts to play in with all the other conversations that we're having. Whether it's connecting to the extension of the streetcar, connecting to Mission Max, it really all connects. And you can see them all layered here. So I'm really proud and excited to be part of this conversation tonight as we bring all those pieces together. So again, another shameless plug, please. January 19th, we're gonna start that public outreach process on our draft implementation plan which is the vision and where we start. What time is where on the 19th? Uh, it starts at 9.30.
and it's on a Friday morning. It's actually in Rocky Point. No, I'm sorry. It's actually at the Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority. So right so across the bridge. Is it going to be recorded so people who have to work for a living can get the information? Yes. Uh, I will I will see if we can get that recorded and get it on our website. Yeah. Scott, Scott. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question about the 275 Nebraska and Florida Avenue uh, uh, study. Uh, how do you see the correlation between the interstate facilities of the street? As far as in relation to, I mean, you have different dynamics. Right. Circuit Street, that's apples to oranges. How do you see a correlation between an interstate corridor and Circuit Street? Well, how, how is that a valid uh, study? Well, I think what you have to realize, and so, sometimes, I think most people realize it, but something I uh, feel is often overlooked is that the interstate is serving a lot of different types of trips long distance trips, medium length trips, short distance trips. And to try to look at transit within that market and only focus on a long distance trip is sort of missing the point. So that's why it's so important that we look at the interstate, that we look at Florida, Tampa, that we look at Nebraska, to look at all the different ways that we can actually serve not just long distance trips, but medium length trips, short distance trips, and long So, in relation to that, you're just looking at the interstate's interface with those two streets? Is that what you're doing? No, from an activity standpoint, because no. I still don't, you know, you have completely different, uh, completely different properties and dynamics in relation to how pedestrian activity, I mean, you can't even, there's no pedestrian activity on the interstate, you're not allowed. So how do you find the correlation and the dynamics between those two environments? There's no correlation. Yeah. You do not have the same metrics that you can analyze between those two environments. Well, we have to likely jump in. Um, sure. I just want to make sure we have time for all the presentations. Sure. Scott, will you be around after? Sure. So there will be some time for Q&A after. We'll do a sidebar sure after. Okay. okay, perfect. Yep. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, and thanks for having us tonight. Um, so uh, Beth Alden, director of the NPO for Hillsborough, and uh, I assume some of you came tonight because you're wondering, are we actually looking at turning I-275 into a boulevard, and if so, how are we looking at that, and what are we looking at? And I have to tell you, this is a big question, and it is going to take us a while to do justice to this question, so I'm going to be back to this group several times um, over the next year. So the first thing that I'm going to do is recap what I told you last time. So if you came to the last downtown community working group, go ahead and check your text messages, your <laughs> stock portfolio, whatever it is, and I will let you know just as soon as I get to the new stuff, which should be oh, I'm going to need Oh, there we go. Okay, so why does the long range plan, which is my organization's responsibility, matter? It conveys our priorities for federal grants and state funding to Washington, D.C., and Tallahassee. This is a long term process. It takes a while to line up projects, but we do get funding over time. So we have to keep working on it. And it our plan builds on the comprehensive plans of all the local governments, including City of Tampa, Hillsborough County. We then look at what are the transportation facilities that are needed, and then that spins off into the five-year and ten-year work programs of the different agencies. It is coordinated across the region as part of the MPO Chair's Coordinating Committee. We look at regional travel needs, crossing boundaries, and we are looking at a lot of uncertainties as we move forward to our 2045 horizon year. Where are we going to be that, that far away from now? And the Atlanta Regional Commission has uh, looked at a whole bunch of different kinds of uncertainties and done scenario planning. So if we get more autonomous vehicles, what does that mean in terms of our growth patterns? And what do we need for transit? Um, if we have more ride hailing services, what does that mean? playing out some of the different uncertainties. We also have uncertainties around what's going on with Tampa Bay Next. 
This is the process that we're all engaging in now to come up with an action plan for transportation. And you know that we talked about different concepts being evaluated, including beltway, trench, elevated lanes, reversible lanes, other managed lane options, boulevard conversion. Um, what if we look at putting express lane down on I-75 instead of I-275? So a lot of other choices, some ideas that the department has floated about how could transit actually fit into an interstate corridor? There's some different options there too. Could it be transit in the median? Could you put rail on the east side? Could you just reuse that shoulder to run buses and get them out of traffic? It'd be kind of a lower cost option, but still could run kind of fast. So some different options, and you just heard Scott talk about the regional transit feasibility plan. The thing about investing in a particular transit border is it's going to shape people's decisions about where they put their businesses and maybe ultimately where they want to buy their homes or, or build condos. Um, so this, these choices that Scott was talking about of on the left, the CSX Great Rail Corridor between USF and downtown Tampa, or on the right, the I-275 corridor, looking at the whole thing from Wesley Chapel to St. Pete. Those can have very different implications for how this area grows and evolves over the next 20 years, and where the station locations are going to be would affect that too. So, um, you know, from a transit, from a transportation point of view, we have looked at both those quarters in the past to see what kind of transit might fit, and um, the uh, I-275 corridor. Uh, it links downtown Tampa and USF, and in both those areas, there are projects to look at autonomous transit. So you heard um, both PART and Downtown Partnership talk about the one downtown. We're also working with the Center for Urban Transportation Research to look at a pilot project on USF campus. So if you start creating autonomous transit shuttles, in some of these higher density areas in our community, is it possible to link them up? Um, maybe using the interstate borders, even running on the shoulder, and it's like we get them out of traffic. On the other hand, we've definitely looked at the freight rail corridors too, and there are some lower cost ways to try to get rapid transit running there. Take the old uh, freight rail track, it still has to be recapped and cleaned up if you're going to run your vehicles on it. But there are some lower cost crash worthy vehicles, like you, this one that you see in the lower right in uh, Dallas Fort Worth. So, definitely something worth looking at. Um, and the boulevard conversion, um, of course, this came out of Josh Frank's presentation. Um, and his point was we need to be looking at the role that I-275 plays both for the shorter trips and the longer trips. So what if we design, redesign that border for the 65% of people who are not making long distance regional trips, who are traveling between downtown Tampa and the USF area? Can we find another location, another way for the regional trips to pass through, such as an I-75 expressway, for example? So, Last time we updated our long-range plan, we laid out some different scenarios. We tried to make them drastically different so that you could see, you know, quantitative, you know, like what the impacts would be on environmental preservation or use of agricultural lands. So three different scenarios we looked at uh, last time. Um, there was sort of a trend scenario. What if you continue to have sprawl? There was a completely the opposite kind of scenario. What if all of your growth is focused on your existing urbanized area and you have lots of rail? And then the one over on the right, what if you have express lanes on all the possible locations? You could possibly put express lanes, and what would that mean? Um, so where we are right now is that uh, if we start asking these questions again, we are understanding that this is going to have implications not only for Tulsa Road, but also for Pinellas, also for Pasco. And so the Tampa Bay Transportation Management Area Leadership Group is working together to create the scenarios together. Uh, and so our process is going to be building these scenarios, which will take a number of months, analyzing them, and then creating a public survey so that everybody's going to get to see how the numbers crunch out, and everybody's going to get to give feedback 
on what they think about those scenarios and what they think the best and the worst parts are. Then based on that feedback, we're going to come up with a hybrid scenario and then come up with a cost funding, a cost sharing strategy among the three counties. So I mentioned that we're moving forward together. We're moving forward together with the Tampa Bay Next team. And we're asking questions like what might scenarios for our area look like? These were Atlanta scenarios. Okay, so this is the part to pay attention if you, uh, if, you know, we're zoning out because you already saw the previous slide. So this is this is uh, some new stuff, and um, I got a chance to sit down um, with my counterparts in uh, Pinellas and Pasco and just brainstorm uh, about what might the scenarios look like at the Tri County level this time. And this again, this is very preliminary. This is why I'm out talking to you so we can get your feedback about this. So let's say we take our trends and we add more automated vehicle technology, more advanced traffic management systems, what could we get out of the transportation network that we have with just a little bit extra on it. So um, you see uh, on this slide a couple of, you know, some images. Top right is the Howard Franklin Bridge, um, which is proposed with two express toll lanes in each direction and the same number of free lanes that we have today. Uh, Another thing that you could do on the interstates to help them work better might be adding ramp meters, which a lot of other cities have done. If you've ever been like on 275 and you're you know, just past the MLK merge ramp uh, and everything slows down, it's because you've got a whole string of merging traffic coming in. And what the ramp meters do is they space out the cars. So it just makes everything work a little bit better. Um, other technology, the automated vehicles in downtown Tampa, you know, what if they could run on the hard shoulder? Um, could we add ferry service between um, Tampa and St. Pete on a more permanent basis? Um, and then uh, up in the, in the top there, you see a, an overpass. That might be something that's built on the US-19 corridor. Uh, it's currently proposed to keep going They've been working their way uh, north from northern Pinellas up towards the Pasco border, uh, building separated grade uh, interchanges like that. So anyway, these are some possible ingredients for a trend plus technology scenario. Well, what if we do something radically different? What if we focus on that beltway concept? Uh, in our area, in Hillsborough, that would probably mean, does this mean? Does. So this line here is I-75, and this is I-4. So what if we focus on those two corridors for express lanes? Is there a way to make a complete beltway? Well, here in Pasco County, State Route 54 goes east-west across the north, just north of our border. And they're interested in talking about express lanes potentially in that quarter. How do we bring it back on down to 275 in Pinellas County? Well, Pinellas has talked before about express lanes in this McMullen Booth quarter, and they're interested in talking about what's going to be built on Bianca Boulevard in South Tampa as an option. That would be two lanes uh, elevated in the median relatively minimal impacts to you know, being able to see the businesses or get to the businesses. Anyway, if that became our major spine, uh, could we use it for transit? We probably could. It probably would mean that we would need to build multimodal centers that then connect rapid transit on the spine to local bus service running through the communities. And it takes some of the pressure off of 275 through Seminole Heights. So maybe that could then be converted to something at grade. So our third scenario that we wanted to float um, builds on the same sex break ground as others. Uh, but we wanted to look at what it means not only for Hillsborough, but also for Pasco and Pinellas. 
So what if you were going to invest in a passenger rail system reusing those tracks, should you extend it all the way across through, um, this is uh, basically along Bush Boulevard. So this is the southern end of Carrollwood, and then um, West Chase, and then Oldsmar, Clearwater, and downtown St. Petersburg. And if you go north, you wind up in Lutz, Landa Lakes, and then ultimately you end up in Brooksville. So you can create quite a commuter rail system, and that can have a very different um, growth outcome for our region. We also wanted to tie in the idea of um, this picture here is the Bright Line station for downtown Miami. So if we had a rail system running here, don't you think that Orlando and Miami would want to tie into it? And could we have something like this in downtown Tampa? So those are our big picture ideas. The first thing that we have to do to actually crunch some numbers for you and, and give you good information about those scenarios is uh, create um, growth maps for the whole Tri-County area. So um, that's what these next slides are about. We have a, a vision map uh, for our county that focuses on the areas that are most ripe for change and redevelopment. And you can see that happening on commercial quarters. So our previous plan has looked at vacant and developable land inside the urban service area and inside the cities. It's looked at redevelopment along corridors. So think about Florida Avenue, for example. It's looked at transit-oriented development around rail stations, uh, expansion areas uh, on the northeast side of Plant City, uh, and also in Southern Hillsborough County, and some continued rural development. So exactly how much growth went into each of those types of areas? We had 70% of growth going to greenfields, 16% going into station area development. What does that mean? Sorry? What does that mean? Station what area that development? Mean? So um, we assumed that there would be rail stations and that there would be more intense development and redevelopment around those rail stations. Than you would other than you would otherwise have, um, and so we basically bumped up our population projection in the rail station areas, and the number was ninety five thousand people more or less because of rail, and ninety one thousand jobs in those rail station areas. And that's what we could accommodate if we had a fixed guideway transit system. Redevelopment, this is a more, more general kind of dispersed redevelopment um, across all, all of the older uh, built up areas. So our more recent numbers, um, this was just presented to the Planning Commission on Monday. So I'm just going to show you a few of the slides. I think some of them have some great graphics. Um, we do have a consultant who is doing our trend analysis of demographic shifts. He's going to be helping us with assessing whether these scenarios achieve our goals. So quality of life, um, physical sustainability, economic prosperity, responsible growth, consistency of action. The number of people that we can actually fit onto our vacant and redevelopable, redevelopable land <laughs> we have about 75,000 acres, and we are just guessing ballpark. This starts to get very rough really quickly. 70% of these acres would be residential, 30% of these would be non residential. I am getting my point, I promise. Okay, so how many people, how many people can fit into 52,000 acres that we have right now? Well, if we keep building the way we have been, which is three units per acre, we're not going to get anywhere close to the projected population that's going to be here by the year 2045. 
if we get up to a slightly higher density of five units per acre, we still won't get there. So we really have to talk seriously about higher densities. Uh, and it's, it's similar with employment growth. So I'm just going to flip through some of these slides to give you a sense of, of what this means. This is our um, development pattern historically, so 1960, 1970. Oh my god, this is going to come up, isn't it? No, it's not. Well, we can send you these slides and post them up on the website. That'll be good. We're happy. Okay. Because it's coming up slowly. <laughs> so this is this is where we are now. With a lot of our available land developed. So it's just going to be very challenging at our current densities figuring out where we're going to put the growth that is expected to come here. So we will likely consume all of our developable land before 2045. We have to look at redevelopment and infill. There is gonna be a lot of pressure to expand the urban services area, to expand the boundary into the rural area. And our transportation system is going to have a lot of challenges. So um, some of the factors that we're going to be looking at uh, as to what um, where is growth suitable, we'll be looking at access from expressways, transit, airport, rail, walkability. We'll be looking at all of these factors to build out the trend scenario and the other two scenarios with the express lanes and the rail. This is a trend scenario map of development of residential development suitability. And we'll probably be focusing uh, on some um, some of these areas in building out the trend. So the timing of what happens next. We'll be finishing up our trend and real estate market analysis and then building the alternative scenarios in early spring. Then through late spring, uh, calculating how do the scenarios perform, and then doing outreach next summer. <coughs> and what I'd love to talk with you about after all of the presentation, if you have suggestions for me, I'd love to hear about what information are you going to want to have about the scenarios that will help you to make the decisions. Because we'll do our best to try to Get you some good data. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. I want to invite Steve to finish it up. Uh, he's going to kick off the last portion of our agenda where we'll hear um, about what's happening at the FDOT level. So, Tampa Bay next is up first. Can everybody hear me back there? Good. All right. So I have the honor of giving you guys an update on Tampa Bay Net. So excited to do that. Uh, so just kind of giving you a little bit of a recap of why we're here and what we're going to talk about. Um, so Tampa Bay Next, the purpose of Tampa Bay Next is to solve a uh, really four problems. A design problem, a demand problem, a choice problem, and a consensus problem. That's kind of what we're here to do. Um, But before we do, I would like to go over uh, just a couple of things uh, because you're probably asking in your mind, okay, what's changed? What is DOT doing differently now? What have we done differently? And so, um, you know, just to kind of give you a rundown of what uh, the efforts that we have made to, to change. Um, the first thing is that we have delayed the schedule uh, of our interstate sales. Uh, and the, really kind of one of the main purposes of that was to uh, better align with what Scott presented to you earlier um, and make sure that the recommendations and the assumptions and the types of things that we're looking at for improvements to the interstate uh, factor in what's best for the region from a regional transit perspective. Um, we have stopped uh, right-of-way acquisition for the I-275 North uh, corridor uh, through Tampa. We have funded project development for the Regional Transit Catalyst Project, which is that project that Scott 
is going to uh, go over with you in January. Uh, we have reduced the footprint of some of those uh, downtown interchange concepts that we were showing over the past several years. Uh, in addition to the no build option, which does still exist and which we are still uh, talking about. Uh, we have uh, done a lot more coordination with all the different transit planning activities and transit planning studies that are going on, as well as the land use planning studies that are going on, the long range plan. And that was really the purpose of coming and giving you an update of all these different studies and activities that are happening because they're all really converging, uh, especially on kind of the downtown core area. And those are uh, plans that we want to make sure that we incorporate and accommodate as part of our study. Uh, we have also uh, rolled out some new concepts. This has happened over the past several months uh, and in our prior meeting about uh, I-275 that do not involve express lanes, which is something that we heard from you over the past several years. Uh, we have uh, been working with some of the local neighborhoods more specifically on uh, developing plans for what to do with the properties that we currently own uh, that are vacant and that are, uh, are uh, need to be rehabilitated, that are, that are, that are not in good condition. Uh, and we have also accelerated the schedule for the height study, which is what we're going to talk about after uh, I sit down, uh, which is the focus on the Florida Avenue and Tampa Street corridor uh, and what improvements can be made to those surface streets. And accelerate that to happen uh, sooner, uh, and that's what we're going to talk about next. So uh, just a quick schedule uh, so that you understand where we're at and what we're doing. Uh, we began the uh, Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement, which is a, a, a reevaluation of uh, the determination that was made in the 90s about the Tampa Interstate Study. Uh, we began that reevaluation in January of 2017, and uh, we had a public workshop in October. Uh, we are going to be working on technical analysis and data collection uh, all throughout next year. We're going to have a second public workshop uh, with you at the end of 2018. And we're looking at a public hearing uh, in mid-2019. And the schedule has been delayed to let all of the other studies that happened before uh, I got up here kind of go first. Um, the uh, the uh, current status is that we are refining, uh, like I said, the different downtown interchange concept, concepts. They have been posted to the website, but they are uh, relatively the same as we presented to you in the past. So if you've been here in the previous meeting, um, a lot of the information, especially this last meeting that we were out uh, <coughs> several months ago, uh, has been the same. Uh, the I-275 North Corridor, uh, that is a separate pd &E study, a separate project development and environment study. Um, that runs from uh, MLK up to Bears. And me, I have a question. There's been a lot of semantic issues saying it runs from MLK up to Bears, but what you're really talking about isn't it from Osborne? Uh, it is from south of MLK, I believe, to, to Bears. That says north of it. Okay, the previous slide showed. Uh, show to be clear, north north it, it, it is Osborne. It is Osborne. It's Osborne. It's Osborne. It's Osborne. So yes, you're correct. Um, so we are working with uh, the MPO, uh, which uh, is uh, where Beth uh, is where Beth is representing. Uh, her presentation was about we're working with Hart, we're working with the city of Tampa and Hillsborough County as we refine these concepts to make sure that what we're doing is not uh, going to preempt or. Uh, be inconsistent with what all these other cities are trying to accomplish. Um, we are uh, coordinating our outreach activities as well as the technical analysis and the assumptions uh, with all of these other studies as well. Um, and then the kind of refined concepts are what we uh, would like to be able to share with you in early next year uh, around that time frame. So we'll come to you again with the maps and the wall plots talking about the more specific details uh, of what we're proposing. So that kind of gives you an overview of where we're at with that. Um, again, we're looking at all these different um, studies that are happening. This is, you know, just the slides kind of that Beth presented earlier. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is that everything that the DOT does and everything that all of our transportation agencies do come out of and have to be supported by the long range permit activities that the MPO does. So it's really important that you understand that relationship uh, of what the long range plan does and can do, uh, and how we all work together to kind of uh, try to achieve the vision of, of whatever our community sets out and says this is what we're going to accomplish. Um, kind of switching gears a little bit and talking about long-term versus short-term improvements. So um, some of you may uh, remember that uh, you know this is the, uh, the, the ultimate um, the reconstruction that we had been proposing for the West Shore Interchange uh, by the airport, Secret 60 Memorial, um, and that is part of this bigger study that, that we've, we've delayed. So in the meantime, what we've done is we've actually moved forward as uh, some, some very short-term improvements to provide relief to some of the bottlenecks in that area. So we're adding a third lane 
uh, of pavement there, coming east off the Howard Franklin Bridge as you go under uh, the various overpasses, kind of past Westshore Mall. Uh, and then we're doing the same thing on the uh, the westbound side. So we're looking for the isolated spots that are causing traffic backups today and trying to do something quickly to address them. Uh, and that's something that we've already uh, announced and that we plan to uh, roll out next year to do in the Westshore area. It's not something that's going to have a lot of impact to the community. It's not something that's going to require a right of way, uh, but it's something quickly that the department can do that will have an immediate relief on some of the traffic backups. There we go. So uh, that is a conversation uh, that uh, before we really start talking about that, we want to get feedback from you. So uh, kind of taking that same uh, concept in mind, so what short-term improvements need to be done? We don't want to delay ever doing anything in this area just because we can't come to an agreement on what the long-term vision is. So uh, some of the things that we've heard uh, over the last several years are things that, that you want to see. Uh, Anything from uh, looking at uh, operational improvements, looking at the traffic signals and the intersections around the interstate that can be improved to address safety problems. Uh, looking at the existing bottlenecks, the I-4 flyover is one that uh, is something that we get a lot of calls about and that we've heard in all of our public meetings that needs to be addressed. Um, these are not things that require a lot of massive work potentially, and so uh, if it's something that we can accommodate and do in the short term with a little bit of work to have a big impact, we want to talk about that. Um, in addition to that, uh, looking at opportunities uh, uh, for some of the intersecting streets, some of the underpasses, these are all short-term things that we heard from you throughout the whole process of the last several years. Uh, and now that we're here talking about slowing down this study, we want to know, is there anything we can do in the short term? And so we're going to be laying out this uh, a survey and sending it out through our, um, our Tampa Bay Next uh, uh, messaging and our emails. And we're going to be asking for feedback on what things that you'd like, you'd like what things you'd like us to do uh, over the next several years. Uh, something that we had done uh, at the end of October uh, that we were asked to do and uh, was looking at uh, all of the existing properties that the DOT owns. Uh, we went out there and uh, knocked on, took a group of us from the office and knocked on about 100 doors and talked to about 50 people about the uh, existing properties that were vacant and uh, the status of those and how those are looking and what we can do to clean those up. Uh, we brought crews out and cleaned up a lot of the, the messes that were there and, and tried to clean things up as best as possible. We know they're not perfect and we know there's a lot more to do. Uh, but again, this kind of demonstrates our commitment to actually uh, walk, walking the walk and not just talking the talk. So um, uh, we are going to be continuing that conversation with the community. And I know we are uh, talking to folks, uh, talking to Rick about what some of those opportunities are to do with these houses that are vacant. And so uh, that's some feedback that we'd also like to get from you or what you'd like to see done with those in the meantime as we wait. And with that, uh, the next update that we will have uh, for you is in kind of February, March time frame. Uh, like I said, we'll be back with some more details about uh, short-term improvements and uh, the status of, of what the next steps are. Uh, but that is the end of my update, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, hopefully at the end, I know we have some, some time to make up for the height study. So, um, thank you for listening and for being here.
make the short-term recommendations. And then while we're studying what we can do more transformative, more longer term, the department can start working on implementing with their partners at the city and heart and others, can start working on implementing some of the short-term things. So that hopefully by the time we get to the end of the study, looking at sort of the, the ultimate ideas, we may have already got some things in the ground. Uh, might be a little bit aggressive, but, but we can turn some things around pretty quickly. The second phase that we're going to start uh, in the beginning of 2018 is looking at more comprehensive solutions. Uh, these are things that, that really uh, transform the way the portal operates. Uh, they have to be grounded in reality, of course, but, but this, and they also have to be consistent and supportive of what the vision of the community is. I think it's important to note that, that we're looking at from basically the northern edge of downtown at I-275, where Cafe Hay is, more or less, all the way up to the river, or maybe just a little bit beyond uh, by Bird Street. And that's a pretty long corridor. So when we say the community, we're talking about, yeah, it's Tampa Heights and Seminole Heights, but within that, you've got different subcultures, different genuses and species of communities. And we need to make sure that we're doing something that's consistent for everybody and then, and then some of our neighbors as well. Um, in terms of public engagement, uh, it's a big part of this, making sure that what we're doing uh, really reflects the character of the community and that there's a consensus for what we do going forward. So the idea here is not to come up with a top-down idea. Um, I live in the neighborhood. I've lived here since 2002 at various different points between north and south. But just because I think something's the best idea it doesn't mean that everybody's going to agree and it's going to resonate. So with a lot of our process is going forward, and you'll see at the end, I'll show you the, the process for phase two as well as some milestones where we want to come back and check in with all of you all and hopefully a lot more people and say, hey, does this make sense to you? What, are we on the right track? Are, are we bringing solutions to the table that are going to improve your quality of life in a balanced way? This is what we've done so far. Um, basically, community outreach throughout. Um, started off with just a series of meetings. We went to different neighborhood associations and said, hey, this is what we're up to. Um, can we broadcast some emails to your, to your membership list? Do you have any comments right now to get us started? Um, went and did a safety assessment as part of that. We did walking audits, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And then we're here talking to you now where the star is about what we're going to do in a minute here is preview some of the things we think we can go ahead and, and start trying to get out there. And then um, really come back through December and January and a lot of these recommendations. We need to come back through and do some technical vetting work that through with some of the different uh, operational units at DOT and to make sure that what we saw in the field makes sense. We can back it up and we can justify going out and making those projects. So here's the study area. Um, the real focus is Florida Avenue and Tampa Street, but also the connecting streets in between, your Hillsborough Avenues, your MLKs. But that being said, we don't want to cast too narrow of a net. Um, we've got some recommendations to talk about in a minute that are over on Central. Over on Ola, I heard Ola brought up way earlier tonight um, as a, a prominent bicycle route that the neighborhood sort of has embraced. So we'll talk about that. And, and if things come up that are outside of this, uh, that, that narrow corridor within this greater influence area, we well, want to take that in and think about it. Because really, these roads all operate as a system together to support the neighborhood and, and the people around the neighborhood. A couple of things that we did, uh, trying to get feedback, like I said, you know, live here, commute these roads every day, but don't know every part of the neighborhood. And so we tried to do some things to get a lot of feedback. Uh, one of the things we did was an interactive mapping site where people could actually come in and, and you could drop a dot on your map and you could say, I love this intersection at Hillsborough Avenue and Fort Avenue. This is the best intersection ever. <laughs> I wish I was more intersections were like that. And I love it so much because I've really gotten to know the person in the yard next to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, sure. But the point was, we're able to get a lot of feedback that way. And what was neat was when you wanted to go and, and complement your favorite part of the transportation infrastructure, and someone else had already complimented it, and you could say, I agree with that compliment. And so we were able to kind of look at the relative importance of issues. Uh, not surprisingly, you probably can't see it, but we were able to do a heat map of those comments and, and just kind of... Uh, some some reason on either side of Hillsborough Avenue is where we got the most comments. Go figure. Um, in terms of developing solutions, uh, again, looking at more things that we can get on the ground quickly versus more transformative. And when I say get on the ground quickly, I also mean not affecting the overall way that the roads operate today for cars. That's embarrassing. This has never happened to me before. Yeah. Only once at a city commission meeting in Sarasota. 
<laughs> and I was so embarrassed that I just fumbled with it, and then they called back. <laughs> this time I turned off the ringer. Um, let's see. This is an example of the mapping tool, and we tried to set up some basic categories so we could aggregate the data. Uh, how many of you, I guess, does everybody that saw us put a dot on the map? You all good about that, right? And so we tried to look at, well, this is just a general community concern versus maybe a pedestrian focused or bicycle issue. And there's going to be some overlap in these things, right? If you don't like the sidewalks, that's an aesthetic feature, it's a pedestrian feature, uh, it may be a, a bicycle issue as well. But basically, um, you see safety being a real focus and pedestrian issues. We had a lot of comments about the sidewalks uh, and the quality of the sidewalks and how you felt on the sidewalks. And we got a pretty good spread of responses. Uh, naturally, because we told people focus on Florida Ave and Hampton Street, that's where they were concentrated. But you can see also people kind of some ways a little bit off the map here, but that's okay. Um, just letting us know what's going on. So we're able to review these and, and make comments. So it's maybe something St. Pete, we don't know. We didn't, we didn't zoom out. <laughs> Horrible at this. Um, and this just sort of, sort of shows the old word cloud approach of kind of what, what comments um, came to the front. You can, you can post a picture, you can put a comment in. Uh, but just some common themes where that traffic on, on Florida Island and Tampa Street just moves too fast. Um, and, and the idea of walking on a sidewalk where you've got traffic going by. 60 miles an hour. Yeah, I was going to say nominally at 40, but we know folks go faster. Um, it's, it's just an uncomfortable feeling. But but also congestion. So on one hand, cars go too fast some of the day. Other parts of the day, cars go way too slow. Uh, and it becomes a, a barrier to motion within the neighborhood. I know that, that and I'll just kind of keep picking on Hillsborough Avenue, uh, when I'm trying to get home after work, I'm not happy because I'm staring at the Indy for a little while as I'm trying to get to the light. But if I'm trying to get to the airport at 5.30 in the morning to go to Fort Lauderdale or something, because my work makes me do that sometimes, uh, now I'm just sitting here waiting for the light to turn green forever. And so it's sort of this, you know, either way we're going to get you. Um, so that's something that, that people balance up. And then also just basic safety issues. And at the same time, maybe because of the rush hour congestion, people cutting through the neighborhood. Um, and you know, we have a, this is a city, we have a street grid. It's not unreasonable that sometimes folks will want to use part of that grid to get somewhere, but, but at what speed? You know, you'd be respectful when you're, when you're trying to get your kids to school on time, as I did today. Walking audits. Again, we thought we had a pretty good idea of what was going on, and, and we do this a lot in, in the industry and in our firm where we go out and walk up and down the road, and it's almost like being a restaurant critic. For a roadway, you go, oh, you know, this is nice, but I don't like the way this works. But in this case, we thought it'd be really good to bring people from the community out. And two of them are with us today, Ruth Fernandez and Alyssa Getzoff, and they both volunteered to come say one or two things about their impression participating in this. Rick, would you care to start? Thank you. Put you on the spot a little bit. Yeah. Thanks. First of all, let me tell you, taking a walk on Florida Avenue with these guys is a different experience. You see things that you might not otherwise see. And uh, I'm having a moment because I see a lot of faces here that I've been working with for over two years. It's weird to be in front of you without being a frog. This is, this is pleasant. Um, the, uh, the walking audit was actually a very eye-opening experience for me. I note I'm a Tampa native. I, I grew up around Ropes Park. I've lived around Florida Avenue most of my life, and uh, but I'm not really a walker or a biker, and I certainly don't walk the bike on Florida Avenue. So what I know about Florida is what I know from racing through at 40 miles an hour or more, like a lot of the, uh, the rest of us do. So when you're actually walking, especially with people that have different types of eyes to see different types of problems. Um, it was it was eye opening to me the the number of things that could be done and not not just in a long term five year study but maybe in the next six months to twelve months which or eighteen months for instance um, I think Damien I think it was you put me on the spot no no no, no I'm just trying to remember I'm trying to re relive the walk but when we were at the corner of Florida Avenue and K Street, just north of the interstate, for instance, this will be the only one I meant on for time constraints. Um, we stood there for about five minutes, probably looking rather odd there, the group of us as people were cruising by, but uh, we, we noted that uh, if you looked at the, the far 
left-hand lane if you're, you know, if you're traveling north. Most cars, as they were coming up Florida Avenue North and came through the overpass area, most cars that were in that far left-hand lane or the westernmost lane on Florida Avenue, they were turning left on K Street, heading down toward the uh, the entrance ramp to get on to, you know, past Tampa Street and then go to get on the interstate, which raised the question. You know, might we consider closing off that lane to through traffic and maybe turning it into a parking scenario where people can park on the curb, even from that point, maybe as far north as Palm, for instance, which would allow for on-street parking and support um, the businesses that are developing along that stretch of Florida Avenue and, of course, from Franklin Street and, and points west. So. Yeah, I'll just mention that as an example, something that never occurred to me for a moment. And it was really weird. You sit there for five minutes and you don't see a single car go through on that lane. Um, and so, good idea and certainly something that would be supportive of the neighborhood. Thanks, Rick. Well, this is a Seminole Heights resident. Do you want to say a word or two for us about your experience out there? Yeah. Survived? I survived. <laughs> Um, it was really interesting. The I live right up near the Starbucks on Central and Hillsboro, and um, it was really interesting. The different um, it was FDOT, City of Tampa Safety um, parts. I was surprised to learn that the number one bus goes every 15 minutes. The one time I tried to take it um, years ago, it was every half an hour. Um, I went on both days, so I did the lower section and my section, I guess. Sure. Um, but there was a lot of thought among the different agencies to come up with um, solutions to these problems. Like, I felt <coughs> the TDS stuff last year, that stuff was just getting rammed down our throats. And this year, I felt like that there is some sort of cohesiveness that didn't exist before. And I don't think it's just blowing smoke up our butts. Um, <laughs> seriously, it's a real dialogue. What's that? It's a real dialogue. Yeah. Um, and I've noticed, it, it was interesting, because we're walking up Florida Avenue, which is not fun to do. But in the spots where there was like a little grass, between the little sidewalk and the um, and the traffic, the you felt a lot safer. Um, some of the issues that were brought up were these crazy ways in which the sidewalks were cut out for people with disabilities. So you'd have to like go up, then make an immediate right, and then make a left, and then go around a street lamp to then continue straight. And that's crazy. I mean, I don't know if anyone's been to Mosey. They have a wheelchair there. Try to use it. It's not that easy. Um, I already see some of the stuff that was probably in progress before. Um, there's a crosswalk going in I, um, at the Independent, which is very important because I live on one side of Florida. <laughs> and to get to the other side is a little, I feel like proper. Um, and so I'll be a lot happier with that to have been. So, really appreciate it. So, yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. And I'm from New York, so I walk everywhere. And I am used to walking everywhere. Three miles, I could do it a clip. But it's not pleasant right now. Um, but if it was, I would have no problem walking downtown and walking back mm -hmm. in a heartbeat. So, thank you. So, that's it. We really appreciate that because we got the chance to get out the better part of we went from about eight to lunchtime, and and we had a decent group out there. Um, and and I kind of like this picture because it shows you if, if it's just you, you can sit on the sidewalk, but if you have friends, uh, it's, it's kind of tough. Walking is really neat because you pick up these things at a micro level that, that you don't get if you're driving or even even sometimes on a bike. So we, we felt that was an important thing to do. What I want to do now is just really quickly go through some of the preliminary ideas. Now I want to warn you, not warn, that sounds so negative. I just want to condition this by saying we're moving really quick in this study and we haven't been able to bring these back and vet them. 
with both the city and Board of and others. So I think all of these things uh, probably have merit as ideas, but whether they can all be included in that short-term implementation or some of them are going to take a little bit longer to work through uh, has not been determined yet. So I don't want you all to come back in a year and say, hey, where is the crosswalk from? These are the, the ideas that came out of the process. So, and the very first one, we we started. Uh, we tried to have a muster point in the morning, and we used Cafe A uh, to meet for the first day. And the very first thing we noticed was that that there's just an incomplete sidewalk along K Street. Uh, and this is a pretty busy road because it's, it's an access point. It's a essentially an extension of the on ramp. It looks like there's space for one. It just maybe there was one that got thrown through by grass. It's hard to say. But that's the type of basic thing that. You don't really notice, but it's an impediment to people walking. The folks who are using transit, uh, it, it takes away from that journey. So we looked at that. Um, this is observation that Rick made where, where really the vast majority of cars coming up from downtown on Fort Avenue um, basically make that left turn to get on the interstate. Uh, I'm trying to joke that you could stand out there and bet each other how long no, we can do that. But <laughs> you really can. It, it, we're not exactly sure what the best use of the, the lane north of there is. But we do know that that even from a safety perspective, just letting people know that this is a left turn lane might stop the odd tourists from being frustrated uh, as they wonder why your traffic's stopped all the way back. So that's something that we looked at. And you can kind of see the dots are going to grow over on the right. That's sort of the key of, of where we are. We're going to add these up. So we're going to go from south to north. Uh, going up, this is uh, Henderson, uh, sort of running through that Franklin Street district, which is really coming along nicely, I think. And the city is looking at maybe making this a four-way stop just from traffic conflicts. So we wanted to incorporate that. But then we also think as, as the armature works and all of that development builds out, you're going to have a lot more foot traffic from this area over here by the river and the, the turning base and everything into these businesses. And so uh, a lot of times we go mid-block crosswalk, mid-block crosswalk, we want to crosswalk. But sometimes it's actually better to actually look at a traffic signal. And, and it's complicated why, but... It, it really helps create um, not just a safe crossing at that location, but can help sort of create better gaps in traffic both north and south of where you put it in. Um, this may not be warranted at the moment, and you can't just willy-nilly put traffic signals in, but it's something we want to keep in our back pocket and look at going forward. Moving north, um, about 10 years ago when Tampa Street was resurfaced going south, uh, there used to be, I think, four lanes through here. It's kind of a very way too many lanes, and it was reduced to three, and the one lane drops here as a right turn lane, and that creates sort of an awkward transition for the cyclist. Back here, the bicyclist has to actually cross over. What we do now when we have sort of that, that more intense bicycle motor vehicle conflict is we'll use uh, the green bike lane markings to, to further enhance the, the, uh, the bike lane, and then maybe do something to carry that transition through. Uh, we could also potentially sort of build out this curve a little bit to just kind of tighten up that intersection and make it safer to cross. On the other side, this is tough. There's a telephone pole right here, but this is one of the examples Alyssa talked about where to get the the, um, the ADA compatible crosswalk in, we actually have this crosswalk around the corner here. And the problem is, is that if you step off from the curb, no one turning right can possibly see you. And so it, it intimidates you. And, and we, want, we want the design of the road to reflect Sort of the safe natural behavior of people and vice versa. This may not fit because of just how constrained everything is with utilities, but it's something we want to come back and look at with the designers. Ola was mentioned earlier. Uh, if you live as I once did along Ola Avenue, you'll see, particularly on Sundays, hordes and bicyclists driving through your neighborhood. It, it is the uh, sort of less stressed bikeway. Uh, through the neighborhood from about Osborne, Rivercrest Park area, maybe all the way to Hillsboro, where it sort of meanders into a different street, all the way down uh, into the downtown. And so what we look at is there's, all is great, it's pretty slow, there's some traffic calming, uh, all the way between MLK and Columbus, speed tables, but you've got two crossings that are tough. Columbus, not so bad, but we want to send the right message, and so this would be uh, an easy crosswalk with the pedestrians and cyclists. And then later on, I'll get an MLK, which is a little bit tougher of an issue. One of the things we look for is, is just providing a safe control crossing point at a reasonable frequency. And so we're always kind of looking, you know, where was the last signal at a crosswalk? Where's the next opportunity for something? And, and we think right here around 26th, you have uh, the Good Samaritan and a relatively busy bus stop. 
Like I said, we don't know yet. We've not gone and done the technical study to see if this location meets the, the technical criteria for a crosswalk, and there's some rules about that um, at the state level. But but we think from a spacing standpoint, one makes sense here. And so we're going to say, let's go back and look and see if we can uh, bet that and, and get something there in the future. Would that be the kind of crosswalk you have in front of that bin? Yeah, uh, typically for a road like this, we use what's called the, the rectangular rapid flash beacons, which are the, the sort of the high on the stroping lights. And those have, uh, those were actually invented in St. Pete with the company out of Sarasota, uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago. They, they tend to have a pretty good track record. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Um, kind of interesting history here. Originally, there used to be a, a right turn island right here. And when the road was resurfaced, um, that island was pulled out. The radius of this curve used to be even bigger, and it was pulled in some, but I don't think it was pulled in enough. Uh, these are very large right turn radii. Um, and what we'd like to do is there's some software we use to model sort of the minimum path that a tractor trailer needs to make a turn without driving up over the sidewalk and running over things or people. But what we'd like to do is put that through here and see if we can't, no, that's a big deal. You can't have somebody waiting to cross and next thing you know, you know smushed. But, um, <laughs> and, and also it, it beats up, it beats up the infrastructure. If there's drainage inlets that destroy the sidewalk, it becomes a major nightmare. But we do think here you've got three lanes. If a truck is coming along, whoops, my fingers are too big for this. If a truck is coming along, um, they don't necessarily need to turn in this very first lane. This is a one-way street. They need to swing a little bit wide and then straighten out, they can do that. So we want to see if there's an opportunity to, to tighten this up some. Uh, moving a little bit to the west, uh, this is another one where, where Highland basically is transitioning over to Tampa Street, and you're basically going through an intersection and a turn at the same time. Uh, I've, it's like the Desecchi's guy, you know, I don't ride my bike work often, but when I do, I go down Highland Avenue. Um, <laughs> Going through here, you're on extra alert that the cars in this outside lane are going to, you know, flatten you. So we're looking at some ways. The other thing is, is a large number of people make a right turn here. We've got some older traffic data for this that suggests that, that this might work out just fine if we just call it a right turn only lane. And so we, like, this is another one we need to go back and do sort of that technical evaluation. But we think there are some ways to sort of tighten this up. This is very wide and scary uh, to cross the pedestrian. This right turn movement coming off of them, okay, can go very fast because they're not having to turn full 90 degrees. And so we're just looking at ways to tighten this up, slow people down a little bit, and then provide better guidance for cyclists. This is Ola at MLK, the, uh, the unofficial official bike ride in the neighborhood. And this is another location where we'd like to look at, at the feasibility of putting a crosswalk. And part of that might be designating Ola as, as somewhat of a bicycle trail. Uh, that might be part of the process. I think that comment was made when Eric was talking about the rollout of the push bike uh, up into these areas. Again, all of these, anytime I show crosswalk, I'm going to quit repeating myself. Anytime I show crosswalk, it means that come back and do more technical analysis. These are some things in the work. Uh, the Violet Street Racetrack, they do the Grand Prix in St. Pete, <laughs> but we have our own little Grand Prix here, Grand Prix here when, we, uh, when we switch over. But this is something that, that Traffic operations at Florida DOT has already looked at, and what they basically have figured out is that usually in the morning everybody's going south, in the afternoon everybody's going north. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to make this northbound crossover movement yield to the southbound movement and actually bring them out and, and, and really um, have this be more like only two lanes through here and then open up a lane go up north on Highland, change the geometry of this a little bit so you're not so crowded. So that's more of an automobile safety measure, but the other thing it'll do is it'll make this crosswalk a little bit easier. The department's also going to enhance this crosswalk with uh, the rectangular rapid flashing beacons, so that if you're trying to get your pizza, you know, you're a little bit better off doing that. This is uh, independent. This is Violet Street, and again, Florida DOT has already got a project in the pipeline to put in a uh, signalized crossing here. That signal will also control uh, the traffic on this part. I'm sorry, Wilder, but Wilder, mm -hmm. and uh, but provides some crossing between the neighborhood, between neighborhoods, and then with the destination. This is going to be a tough issue. It's why 
we can do some point specific projects that help, but ultimately we got to look at the overall system. If we keep having a restaurant or a bar open up on one side or a shop or whatever it is, and then somehow they find the park on the other side of the street, and, and we're constantly going to have this, um, which is a good thing from a neighborhood and business development point of view, but going, it's not feasible to pop a car truck in every time somebody opens a restaurant. So we're going to have to think of better ways to manage the pond and slow down traffic. Uh, another issue we have is if you're on Hillsboro, you have three lanes and then you have two. And people would never do this, but some people might, is they whip up here to Highland, come down, cut through traffic. Usually there's a queue of cars in the afternoon. Go down this street, don't run into this new building, and then kind of make friends, <laughs> and then they pop on over to Central. Yep. And, and that's not great. We don't. One thing is if, if folks here and there do that, but we don't really want that to be the system. At the same time, you have people that will jump into this two-way left turn lane and run all the way up to the signal. And that can be very dangerous if somebody is trying to nose through or make a turn or, you know, heaven forbid, walk. Uh, so what we talked about doing, and this is something that, that City Tent was also aware of, this is City Street, this is State Highway over here, is, uh, you know, just formalize those turn lanes, but also make it where people can't just shoot through. Uh, because my younger son forgot his backpack this morning, I was actually going back up on Florida. These are anybody's kids uh, crossing the street to go buy coffee, probably, from the high school. Don't blame them. Uh, they helped contribute to this presentation. But this, is, <laughs> this is the other reason we'd like to get this island in here, because people will cross between um, you know, businesses and parking. I think there are some apartments going in here, and then restaurants on this side. So in addition to helping <coughs> to cut through traffic, helping to make things safer for automobiles, it would also help folks cross the street more easily. There is a bus stop on, on the other side, on both sides of the street there. Hillsborough Avenue, a few years back, this was looked at, and part of it is just tightening up the intersection, making it more crossable. Same number of lanes as you've seen before, but really just reconstructing uh, mostly this corner, which is way too big, and then potentially putting in some uh, channelization to break up that crossing and make the intersection tighter. Also, uh, DOT is already looking at a project to reconstruct the traffic signal and, and do uh, arrows for eastbound and westbound that would change uh, the way they behave. So in the middle of the day, you could go ahead and turn left with, with traffic the way you do now. But in rush hour, you could only turn left if you had the arrow. One of the most frequent comments we got on the north and the south was that you don't get an arrow if you're going against traffic. And this has two problems. People that know about it, like me, cut down Henry. I do it at a reasonable <laughs> speed. Other people may not. Uh, the people that don't know about it get stuck there forever and may eventually jump out into the through lane and so that's another thing we've got to go back and look at we know that'll sacrifice some capacity of an already overburdened intersection but um, not having that short protective phase in both directions is problematic central is a big one we've got a lot of folks uh, getting to the starbucks but also kids going to high school a lot of walkers going to both the high school and the middle school somewhere oh right here that way. Um, and so we got to look at this. This is tricky because this is really the beginning of the on ramp back here. So we're not sure if this is really feasible, but can we tighten this up and help improve conditions? And I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go quickly. A couple of crosswalks going further north. We don't have anything between Hillsborough Avenue and Hannah, and then nothing again between Hannah and Sly. So we'd just like to see are there a couple places where it makes sense to get some control in there? And then some general things. Uh, one of the big things we see is that the lighting out there is hit or miss, probably mostly miss. Uh, we're kind of got a tailwind on this one at the state level. DOT is looking at enhancing lighting in sort of urban, high pedestrian uh, corridors. So there are some projects at, at around here, uh, but not one that's totally focused on Port Avenue. So we think that's something that we can come back and do. This DOT uh, district has had great success working directly with the city to get lighting projects done quickly. And so that's something that just provides not just safety from traffic, but also from a personal security level. Um, there are issues with the sidewalks, trees that once were that now are holes, um, sort of just incongruities and maintenance issues. We want to work on that. Uh, working with TPD tends to be overstretched, but uh, speed enforcement is a thing. And then just generally making sure that signs and sidewalks and things are up to snuff from a maintenance point of view. Um, going forward again, 
I'm going to shift gears a little bit into the next part, a clear vision of what's going to happen next. As part of this, we want to go back to a lot of studies done. Most of these have been south of Hillsborough Ave, but we wanted to take out of those and, and not just reinvent the wheel. Uh, heritage, identity, community, safety is a big thing that comes up in all these studies. Connectivity, so not just being able to travel along the corridor, but being able to get across. Economics, mobility options, walking, biking, transit, and then focusing on the neighborhoods and, and really connecting these neighborhoods to each other and then into the downtown. Different concepts have come out of that. Uh, transit improvements, trolley circulators, bike pen emphasis, some talk about two-waying, the one-way streets, enhanced the street grid, traffic calming, but also thinking about green space, aesthetics, uh, openness. We asked... Okay. Can you advance the slide? Okay. There's some traction here. Um, we did a bunch of neighborhood meetings to also get you know, the take on this. Um, sat at the Sunday market, went to Windexi Junior High Junior Civic Association. We actually talked to middle school kids, which was neat. We we're trying to get a couple of them here today, but it couldn't, couldn't work it out. Also, the survey and mapping. And I want to talk a little bit about the survey. We got 319 surveys in. Um, most people that took the survey used the corridor. Not surprising uh, that folks do that. Um, Frequently, not just use it for commuting, but also frequent businesses along the corridor several times a week. So that's sort of the most common response. Um, most people that, that use it for commuting drive. That's not surprising. Uh, but after that, a respectable number of cyclists, uh, kind of a long walk, telecommuting, other options. Folks that, uh, and also other modes, uh, biking and walking show up more there. Biking and walking show up more. For people that are going to businesses or, or traveling within the study area, than folks that are commuting along, and that makes sense from a distance point of view. Um, but still, most people drive for that too, and that's something that you know we'd like to work on. Uh, the ride sharing, Uber, Lyft, taxi, whatever, is a growing part, and that's good for a lot of reasons, especially because it doesn't create as much demand for parking. Uh, we're going to skip some. We're going to do some live surveys, but I think we're going to not. Do that in the interest of time, but we can talk after. Generally, people's assessment of all the modes in the corridor today was not great. Very <laughs> middling. Uh, you know, that's not surprising. Um, we also asked people the question. I kind of made these statements. You know, what what's the purpose of these roads? And one of them was to connect North Tampa and you know Carrollwood and Blitz to downtown. And that's the first one. Surprisingly, not many people in our survey area thought that was the one that resonated the most. But then we also said stuff like, well, it's an important thoroughfare. It's important for sort of transportation, but it needs to, to serve other purposes as well. Or maybe it's not that important, or it shouldn't be that important for sort of these commuter trips. It's more about navigating within the neighborhood. And then finally, we said, you know, to have with everybody else, it's our main street. We don't care if people's, you know, can get through it or not, it's most important that it, it be a, for the community more so than as a thoroughfare. And what's interesting and makes our job a little bit harder going forward is that while we expect that most people that live around here wouldn't want to see it as a highway, there's sort of a broad, you know, almost an even split between these other opinions. So we've got to find, uh, you know, the reasonable center as we go forward. We asked people, you know, what's what what does it need the most? And it was like a pick five, but we, we aggregated those. And what you see come out the most is uh, better biking and better walking. Transit is important, traffic calming, but really the, the sidewalk issue is, is the most prominent thing. So that's kind of starting from the grassroots up. Um, going forward, um, we've got the website. The website's going to evolve because we're not as much going to be talking about short-term quick fixes as, you know, what are your performance measures? What are your priorities going forward? Uh, getting into ideas about uh, alternative concepts and then going through and eventually uh, picking something and prioritizing. And so as we move forward, that's going to change. Um, and then moving into the implementation stage. But but the website is heightsmobility.com. So if you're not already going out there, check it out. And then uh, phase two, this is basically the major steps. I'm going to go through these and just explain. Uh, ongoing community outreach and coordination. And each one of these 
stars is sort of a milestone where we want to come back and say, hey, here's what we just got done doing. Does this make sense? And we're getting into the next step. Give us your ideas. And so we go through and first talk about performance measures. How, how should we judge the different alternatives? Develop some conceptual alternatives, some pretty basic, easy things that might be kind of out there. Um, we go through those and then we evaluate them. And part of that's a feasibility analysis. Is this going to work at all? Um, and then some of it is, is more technical. Go through and then, and then bring that back in. And what that does is we're going to then take the best parts of these alternatives, the stuff that sticks, and sort of that high level screening, and mix and match, create some hybrids, things that we think that actually go forward and get, get built. Um, and then you know, refine those, come back in and evaluate and pick something. And each step along the way, we want to come back in and say, hey, here's what, what we've done, here's where we're going, do we have a consensus to move forward? And then ultimately, uh, an implementation plan to go out there and get the stuff designed, funded, and, and built. And there's some funding already out there, but then there's always you know, the next level of that. Uh, so that's our process going forward. We are almost at 7.30. Do you want to wrap up? And... Yes. Okay, there you go. Thank you very much. Thank you.